and the PhD in uh, MIT in operating research. And he's, uh, he, he also worked uh, when he was young at IBM Research. And uh, uh, his main area of research is uh, applied probability and the stochastic process. And he received the Arlen Prize in applied probability in 2004. So let's thanks uh, Professor David Kamanik. Welcome here to give this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, th thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, share, share this uh, work with you. Uh, I, I'm in the Sloan School of Management. Uh, Operations Research Center is where um, many of the students who work uh, in this area are. I'm also a member of IDSS and also Laboratory of Information Decision Sciences. As I sometimes joke, I have a multiple affiliation disorder and I'm not too, I'm kind of proud of it <laughs> at the same time. Uh, this is gonna be, um, as, as, um, as announced, this is, uh, is going to be somewhat of a mathematical talk, but I will really try to very hard to make it as accessible as, uh, as possible, so no prior knowledge of, for example, statistical physics is uh, uh, expected, uh, and for that matter, uh, uh, I'm not uh, an expert in statistical physics uh, myself. So let me start with the, uh, with the research agenda in describing research agenda in broad uh, strokes. Um, inference um, problems basically boils down to some kind of a, a computational problem. It could be a problem of learning regression coefficients, could be learning the means uh, of a k-means uh, clustering, it could be uh, um, uh, learning maximum uh, uh, posteriori probability. Some kind of algorithmic question of, of a sort needs to be solved. Uh, and perhaps the uh, most interesting and exciting uh, development in modern day in statistics from the algorithmic point of view that has emerged recently is that the problems which are borderline trivial in a classical statistics settings when the number of parameters is small turned out to be often extremely difficult to solve um, uh, in, the, in the modern setting because of the data size, because of the model size, big data, and because uh, of the presence of various kinds of um, structural restrictions, like sparsity, or discreteness, or dimensionality, or whatnot. Um, now, I'm interested for the per in, in this talk and this work, I'm interested in difficulties in solving various computational problems. Um, the canonical way to model algorithmic difficulty, computational difficulty, is NP completeness, hardness, the complexity classes in theoretical computer science. But these are not very well suited for the inference, statistical type inference, because uh, complexity classes assume that nature produces adversarial instances. So the goal would be, is to construct algorithms that work for all instances or to argue that you cannot have an algorithm that works for all instances. This is the canonical NP completeness, NP hardness paradigm. Um, but in statistics, uh, data and models is, are not necessarily worst case. You can often model them by reasonable probability distribution. So the presence of uncertainty in probabilistic models changes the game, so an NP completeness and hardness is not necessarily a right paradigm for understanding uh, nevertheless present and apparently present hardness of conducting inference. So um, um, how do we go about that? Uh, we, de we do need a new theory addressing computational hardness and tractability for statistical inference. Um, we do need it because, as has been observed by many researchers in many contexts, primarily in stylized 
high dimensional statistical models, it appears that uh, an interesting uh, gap uh, emerges between what can be done by tractable algorithms and what can be done in principle from information theoretic or statistical consistency perspective. And a certain gap appears uh, in many of the models, which says that, well, by brute force, you could actually learn the model, uh, but that would take a time forever. But if you want to construct a tractable algorithm, you can often do that, but in the uh, more restrictive regime. And hence, the gap is uh, created. And I'll give you several examples of that shortly. Um, we want to understand the reasons for that. And what I want to do today is share several examples where arguably the reasons for computational hardness emerges from complicated um, landscape of the solution space, whatever that means. At this point, it probably means nothing if you haven't seen it before. And one particular instantiation of this complicated topology of the solution space comes in the form of so-called overlap gap property that we owe to statistical physicists for discovering in the first place. And thus, this concept might uh, give a good alternative way to understand which problems are tractable and which problems are hard. So let me give you the first, let me now give you I'll share with you three examples where such a gap between uh, statistically solvable problem versus computational solvable problem uh, appears. And the first example is one of the simplest problems to state that one can imagine. The problem is as follows. You have a matrix M by N. You have parameters K and L. And your goal is to find the largest weighted submatrix of this matrix. It right? doesn't get easier than that at least to describe the problem. So uh, K and L are parameters of choice. Uh, and uh, because we are not asking for the matrix to be consist of contiguous rows and columns, uh, this problem naturally suffers from combinatorial explosion. Right? The number of choices, if you were to solve this problem by brute force, the number of choices is just too large to try all of them. So we need something else. Um, this problem probably, uh, so who cares about this problem? This, well, you could probably reduce any problem to this problem. Right? So this is almost like a universal, uh, universal combinatorially hard uh, problem, but let me give several examples of uh, application to these problems in the statistical setting. So in statistics, this problem is known as bi-clustering. Uh, and comes up in various applications, including genetics, drug design, uh, and energy networks and social networks. In genetics, uh, this problem has been uh, studied quite extensively recently uh, in the context of genes by gene expression uh, matrices, where the rows correspond to genes, columns correspond to some kind of a gene expressions, and finding Submatrix of large average value or large, uh, uh, large by means of some other ma metric uh, could correspond to something like finding a collection of genes and genes expression corresponding to some kind of a sickness, like cancer or diabetes and things like that. Um, there is a nice survey here uh, by Madeira and Oliveira who uh, study a lot of different techniques to uh, address uh, this problem. Uh, and because the brute solving this problem in brute force is, uh, takes a long of time, so five days uh, for some of the uh, examples of such data, then heuristics have to be developed. So this problem of finding largest uh, average submatrix is hard not only theoretically, but uh, empirically as well. So, um, at least according to the experience uh, of people who have tried to solve it in applications. Another, uh, very quickly, another application of this is uh, drug activity, where you have drugs versus, um, not drug, um, chemical compounds versus their descriptors, and you want to find, solve the largest matrix problem here because it will reveal you uh, 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 how different chemical compounds are effective depending on the 
uh, features that they have. And last example that has been looked at recently is the context of um, detecting the failure of, of the energy system. So this is uh, it's specifically in this paper, this was done in the context of uh, trying to detect if uh, one of the units in the air conditioning system of the big uh, uh, environment fails by looking at the signals of the temperature detected uh, uh, by sensor network and looking at the time-depending correlations of the signal. And the uh, problem of largest uh, average submatrix uh, was uh, solved here by various kinds of uh, heuristics, again, as a method to detect the failure in the system. Okay, so uh, let me share with you now uh, a bit of a theoretical background. What do we know about this problem uh, of largest submatrix problem from the theoretical point of view. And now I'm going to introduce the, as, as a stylized version of this problem as one could imagine. Okay. So the stylized version of the problem is to assume that all the entries of this matrix are IID, standard normal Gaussian. Okay. It doesn't get better than that, at least in terms of description. So we have, um, and also to simplify, let's assume that the matrix is a square. So it has the same number of rows and the same number of columns. And the submatrix that we're trying to find also is square. It has the same number of uh, rows and columns. K is L and M is N. Um, so this problem has been looked at recently uh, in these pa in, in this papers, and it turns out that uh, it's fairly easy to describe, uh, at least asymptotically, the optimal value. So, uh, we, in other words, we know what's the value of the largest uh, submatrix uh, is. So you look at the largest average uh, submatrix of k by k, we do know what's the average value. It turns out to be given by the following fairly simple expression. Just to remind you, n is the size of the matrix, and k is the size of the submatrix. But this is an existential result. It just tells you, gives you the promise that such a matrix uh, exists. It's a completely different matter to actually find it by algorithmically. And this is where the hiccups uh, begin. So what do we know algorithmically? Um, several algorithms have been proposed in various uh, uh, in various sources, uh, and if you analyze in, the, in this context uh, the algorithm, the best of them uh, comes short of the optimality by a multiplicative constant. So just to remind you, two times the square root is the optimal value, asymptotically, and the best of the algorithm comes a bit short here. So for that, you would need to uh, verify that indeed, I'm not lying, this number is smaller than two. Okay? And it doesn't, and no better algorithm seems, that this more or less state of the art. Arguably, this is a fairly recent problem, state of the art. Who cares? Maybe this is just a matter of one or two years. Somebody will come up with something better. That's possible. But in fact, uh, so, but at this point, nothing better is known. In fact, this problem has roots, uh, deep roots in uh, one of the hardest questions in, in the theory of random graphs introduced by CARP in 1977, which asks to find the largest so-called clique in the random Erdős-Rényi graph. So if you've seen uh, random Erdős-Rényi graphs and know what the clique is, that's, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you know, that's it's not terribly important. Think of replacing the matrix that I have here with Gaussian entries by 0, 1 Bernoulli entries. More or less, it's the same problem. Um, okay, so, um, and, but that version of the problem, the clique version of the problem, has been open from 1977. So it's 40 years old, uh, uh, more than 40 years old, uh, open. Um, open in the sense that there is a gap between the uh, existentially large object, the clique in this graph, versus the, uh, what can be solved by uh, fast algorithms. 
Uh, naturally, this up, uh, uh, may, maybe I should uh, uh, reiterate that. Uh, naturally, this optimal solution can be found by brute force, but we're interested in algorithms which run fast, polynomial time. Let me give you another, another example of a problem that has been looked at very extensively uh, recently. So the formal uh, uh, statement of the problem is here, but it might be a bit easier to parse it through the uh, description uh, here. So the idea is that, okay, so initially we looked at the, this Gaussian IID matrix, which you can think of as a pure noise. But there is no signal in this model, right? So let's introduce the signal. So the signal comes in the form of the rank one sparse uh, matrix. So you have a vector you, which you can alternatively write like, like this. So you have a S sparse vector of zeros and one. You take the, its outer product with itself. You give a certain strength uh, to this rank one matrix and you pollute it with noise. So this is a signal, this is a signal strength, this is the noise. And you observe matrix J. That's the, what you observe. So it's, a, it's a polluted, uh, noisy observation of rank one matrix. Very stylized model again. And the goal is to be able to learn this rank one uh, matrix or its vector representation. Um, whatever that means to learn. So it gives some kind of a non-trivial information about this uh, vector. Um, so, okay, so what do we know about that? Uh, that? A bit of a background. The problem has been looked at quite extensively recently, um, and this is very incomplete uh, uh, list of references. I'm sure I missed quite a lot of other important references here. Uh, and just to summarize the state of the art, um, this is what we know. Um, well, it turns out that, perhaps not surprisingly, that the strengths of the signal here should be at least something for you to hope even to be able to, 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 to say something non-trivial about this signal. So, in other words, if this quantity here, lambda, is very, very small, then all you see is pretty much noise. So it's statistically hidden. The signal is statistically hidden in the noise, and there's not much you can say about that. And that, so that quantity is known. It's, uh, I mean, it's, we have sort of computed it fairly accurately in, in, in a recent paper to be posted soon. Uh, but it's the fact that such a quantity should exist, it's uh, is not surprising at all. It shouldn't be surprising at all. Perhaps what's surprising is that where you can solve the problem to be able to actually detect this hidden uh, rank one matrix you need the strength of the signal to be at least something, and that something is larger than what's, uh, what you can do in principle information theoretically. So there is a bigger constant here, lambda of comp, comp stands for computation, such that if strength of the signal is larger than this quantity, then in fact you can, you can uh, recover a good approximation of the signal in some appropriate sense. By the way, if you have any questions here, I'm happy to throw this square-looking ball in the middle of the talk. We don't need to wait till the end because maybe some. Uh, yes. Okay. So. Um, uh, uh, yes. So no, no. Uh, first, let me repeat the question because you don't have a microphone. I do, so I have to for the recording purposes. So if I understood your question correctly, does the, uh, I, uh, no, I did not understand your question. So can you repeat it then? There is, on, no, when, it's not if and only if. Uh, so the question is that, is this statement if and only if? No, not at all. It just says that we do know algorithms when lambda is bigger than lambda comp. And 
the regime in between, that's the fair game. We don't know. Uh, and we don't have any kind of a formal hardness result uh, in, the, in that regime. So th thank you for your question. Other questions, maybe about this model or previous model or, or, okay, if you don't have questions, let me introduce the first, third example, which exhibits the same phenomena, and that's a, probably a, a model which is familiar to all of you or most of you. It's a high-dimensional, celebrated high-dimensional uh, linear regression uh, model that has been the focus of the last 10 or 15 or, in fact, 20 years. So here's a stylized, I don't need to motivate the regression model for you in this audience, of course, but uh, let me introduce the very stylized version of this model. Um, so in the vector form, uh, we have a matrix of independent variables x. Uh, we hit it with the regression vector beta star. We pollute it with noise. We observe y. Our goal is to recover the regression vector from the independent variables x and dependent variable y. Canonical linear regression model. Um, but we are interested uh, in the regime, which is a high dimensional, uh, in, we, interested, we are interested in the high dimensional setting. And what it means is that by motivated, by, again, by big data uh, application, where the number of features, P, could be larger than the sample size N. So N here corresponds to the sample size, is the number of observations that we have. P is the dimension of the uh, regression vector. That's the number of features. In modern day applications, it could easily be the case that you see 10,000 samples, and you're trying to learn a regression model where the number of features is 30,000. Not too unusual. Uh, unless you introduce some kind of a regularization, additional assumptions, like uh, some kind of a regularization assumption, the problem is hopeless because you will certainly suffer, or, uh, suffer overfeeding. And standard and, and uh, canonical way to regularize the problem is to assume sparsity. In other words, assume that this, uh, the regression vector has only k non-zero uh, entries. Uh, so this the, the, uh, uh, denotes the zero norm, which is just simply the number of non-zeros. Beta should be beta star. I apologize for this um, typo. Um, and uh, so we want to learn a k-sparse vector from x and y. So bit of a background, really summarizing and compressing the last 15 years of amazing programs, uh, pro uh, amazing progress in, uh, in this area to so just a few slides. Um, here's what we know. Naturally, the most reasonable way to solve this problem is the maximum likelihood estimation. It was a Gaussian uh, maximum likelihood estimation to solve a quadratic minimization problem. Simply find the vector beta, which is closest to y when you hit it with x, and satisfies the sparsity constraint. This is, could be equality or less than or equal to depending how, how exactly you know the sparsity of the vector beta. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, that raises at least two questions. Question number one. Uh, when you do that, is this a good a way to solve these problems from statistical perspective? Are you getting something which is close to the to ground truth? But the second related question is that how we, would you even solve this problem in light of this hard combinatorial constraint here that you have here? This is a combinatorial constraint. It's non-convex problem. It's not clear how to solve this problem. Okay. So... Um, the spectacular success of convex uh, minimization-based uh, approaches, due to many uh, authors uh, listed here, but this is, again, a very incomplete list, is to, uh, again, I apologize, should be less than or equal to uh, here to make it uh, convex, is to replace the hard constraints with the convex constraints less than or equal to, okay? And it turns out that, um, under some assumptions on the statistical um, distribution of the in independent and independent variables, uh, you kill two birds with one stone. You have a tractable problem 
And when you solve it, you recover the ground uh, truth. In particular, if the entries of x are IID Gaussians, and in, 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 if the noise is IID Gaussian, as a result, y is uh, Gaussian um, uh, as well. And there's various extensions of this to sub-Gaussian distributions and whatnot. There's uh, uh, many extensions uh, of that. So this works. This is uh, indeed a spectacular success of convex minimization-based uh, methods. Uh, but it only works if the sample size is large enough. Okay, so for the case of the Gaussian distribution, uh, you need the sample size to be roughly of the order of uh, sparsity times the logarithm of the number of features, which is impressive by itself because it only depends logarithmically on the number of uh, features. Um, and uh, right, so this is again summarizing the whole body of work in just a couple of slides. Now, it's not surprising that you need a certain minimum sample size to be able to learn the problem. Right? Uh, so if you only have uh, one sample, how much can you learn from one, one, one sample? If you have a, you have a noisy system. Uh, so perhaps it is the case that this is the number of samples that you need to be able to learn the problem full stop. Regardless of computationally efficient math, math, methods, maybe maybe you need that many samples. But it turns out that's not the case. It turns out that if you were willing to accept brute force method, where you just brute force search for all k sparse vectors and find the one which is closest, then you don't need that many samples. You need fewer by orders of magnitude, and that's the uh, reduction in the sample size. You don't need to, by the way, uh, no, none of the actual values here on, 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 uh, is, is important. The important thing here is that the n in for is smaller than n convex by uh, order of magnitude. So thus you have this uh, challenging regime, this infamous information theoretic versus computation gap, where uh, in order to learn the problem, whatever that means, you have certain minimal number of samples, but if you want to learn it by computationally tractable methods, you have more uh, samples, and you have this region in between about which we simply don't know what's happening there. Maybe some clever algorithms exist. Maybe do, they do not. Um, okay. Another example of information that I got. So three examples of the same phenomena. Now I want to start introducing some ideas of what could explain this apparent hardness of these problems. Um, first, unless there's questions. Any quick questions? OK. So first, I just gave you three examples of the phenomena, but it's wider than that. There's a long list of problems which exhibit similar kind of phenomena. This is a, part, this is a list. What has been observed by researchers, uh, and this is what I sort of want to summarize here, is that indeed it appears that the, when the regime where the problems are hard, the solution space, whatever that means, looks different from the regime where the problem is uh, tractable. Uh, it, thanks to the presence of this so-called overlap gap property, which is of topological nature. And it's actually very simple to describe. So what I'm going to do now, and it's, uh, we should credit statistical physics and specifically spin glass theory for introducing this important concept. So what I'm going to do in the remaining 10, ten minutes is to go back to these three problems and describe what the solution space looks like in the tractable in the, and the non-tractable regime, given that I only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I'll probably do the first two, largest submatrix problem and the regression, uh, no, first and third, largest submatrix problem and the regression problem, and the third one I will leave for the after the talk uh, questions. OK, so let me remind you the setting. The setting is that we have an n by n matrix with the Gaussian IID entries. 
we want to find the largest k by k sub matrix. There is super stylized uh, problem. Uh, we know that there is optimal value. I told you the value earlier is twice log square root log n over k, but whatever. There's some optimal value. Here's what we're going to do now. We're going to slice the solution space based on the proximity to the optimality. So we're going to just look at the fix of some approximation factor alpha, which is some number between 0 and 1, and ask ourselves, what do the matrices which are alpha close to the optimality look like? If they look like anything interesting at all. More specifically, let's pick any two such matrices, C1 and C2, which have average value alpha close to optimality. Uh, what we're going to look at, and promise you, you can ignore safely this theorem. I'm just going to explain in words uh, what I'm about to show by means of a picture. We will look at how many common rows and common columns these two matrices can have. So you have matrix C1, matrix C2. They're both alpha close to optimality. Can they have, for example, 30% common rows and 40% common columns? And this 30 and 40 will be our parameters that we will play with and to see uh, uh, if we get something interesting. So this theorem just says, the, the whole takeaway from this theorem is that that's computable. We can actually compute it for any fixed number of common number of rows and fixed number of common columns. So that's, that's the only utility of this theorem. Details are unimportant. Um, and as it, as it turns out, there is a certain phase transition around the value of proximity to optimality, which is given numerically here. So what is the phase transition? Uh, below, if, if the approximation to optimality is below this quantity, then the space of realizable intersections in terms of number of common rows and number of common columns is a connected space. Um, so what I have here in color, every dot in, with, with the color here means realizable intersections. So for example, if I take 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 here, that's a dot. That means that there are mat pairs of matrices with 20% common rows to 40% common columns, which are alpha closed to optimality. Um, and as a result, the model does not exhibit the overlap gap property. Why am I calling it overlap gap property? Because what happens uh, above this phase transition property, about, uh, above this phase transition value, this region becomes disconnected. Uh, so you have this kind of topological phase transition um, in this model. Disconnectivity means that matrices achieving nearly optimal values are sort of disconnected from each other. There is an island of them in one location of the room and in another island of them located in a different location, and they're disconnected. And you can imagine that this creates all kinds of obstruction to algorithms to find them, like if you try to run Markov chain Monte Carlo type methods or steepest descent or steepest ascent method. And indeed it does. The Markov chain Monte Carlo method will fail to find the solution in polynomial time. Of course, if you run it forever, you, it will find it. But if you want to find it fast, it will, it will not happen. Um, I have, what, uh, three, five minutes to wrap up? OK. Let me, con let me share a, a similar phenomena uh, uh, in the context of high-dimensional regression. So, in words, what this represents mathematically, again, not expecting you to parse it perfectly, but in words, what this represents is that, remember, a priori, we want to find the L2 minimization problem. We want to find the vector that fits the regression model as best as possible, subject to sparsity. But now we put an additional constraint. We are saying that among those vectors, Let's only look at those which with a fixed angle with the ground truth. And we're going to be slicing it with respect to this angle. 
Alternatively, maybe it's easier to, to think about this. this. This codifies amount of common support between the vectors that we'll look at and the ground truth vector. So in particular, and, and we're gonna parameterize by value between zero and one. When zeta is zero, then we're just landing right on the ground truth vector. When zeta is one, that describes describes a set of vectors which have no common support with the ground truth. This is the worst situation. The first situation is best. The sec this is the worst situation. When, when you have solutions which have nothing to do with the ground truth. So we parameterize by this overlap value and look at this function. And this is what uh, you discover. This minimal complex, the minimal sampling complexity that the methods such as lasso, compressive sensing, and other methods that needed this 2k log p uh, value that appears in the context of regression, uh, convex minimization based regression model is not a coincidence. It actually marks a phase transition point. When the sampling size is above this quantity, this restricted, the sliced optimization problem is perfectly monotone. So, and perfectly monotone in the right direction. In the sense that the closer you get to zero corresponding to being on the ground truth, the smaller is the value of the optimization problem. So optimization kind of leads you naturally to, towards the ground truth. This is if you are above the uh, uh, sampling threshold about which the convex-based minimization methods do succeed. But if you drop below, the picture changes and it becomes no longer monotone. And this lack of monotonicity is a problem because it means that if you start here, you have vectors which have value one here corresponds to vectors with no common support with the ground truth. So you have beta here some vectors beta, they have no common support with the ground truth. They achieve the cost of about 1.6. But if you wanted to land on the ground truth vector zero, you would have to go against the cost. You would have to start increasing the cost before you start decreasing the cost. Because you would need to overcome this increasing cost barrier. And that, in other, alternatively, if you put the draw a line here, this creates an overlap gap uh, property. All the near optimum, so to speak, vectors are, are either pretty close to the ground truth or far. And everything is in between, suffers from the higher cost. And that creates an obstacle to algorithm, such as the steepest descent type algorith algorithm or gradient descent in the right uh, appropriately defined most likely Markov chain uh, as well. This is the same picture, it's just uh, uh, when you drop below the information theoretic uh, sampling uh, 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 value, but I'll, I'll skip that, that's not, uh, not gonna discuss that. What this theorem, what this theorem says is that uh, this picture that I showed you is actually rigorized, it uh, all can be polluted with words and write quantifiers and so on in the interest of time. I'll skip that. Very similar thing also happens to be take place in, uh, in this spiked submatrix uh, matrix detection uh, problem. I'll skip that. That's a recent joint work with uh, Jagannath and Subhabrata Sen, who is, by the way, joining uh, Harvard uh, this year. And let, let me conclude. Um, uh, I the lesson learned is that statistical physics possibly offers a new theory of complexity of inference problems arising in high dimensional statistics and machine learning data. It might offer more insightful and appropriate way to think about complexity in models involving uncertainty. Uh, of course, we don't understand the nature of this complexity fully. And importantly, we also don't understand how does it link with the classical paradigms of complexity such as NP-hardness and NP-completeness. And that's the end of my talk, thank you.
uh, what uh, the drawing of this curve is not exactly the gamma uh, because we only are able to get approximation of this. Uh, we only we only are able to compute this uh, estimate this function. So this actually corresponds. I skipped it. This corresponds to some upper bound on this curve, which behaves like that. But we can show monotonicity and non-monotonicity for the true uh, function. So you know it's the yeah. Yeah. R right. So the question is, can, I, can we analytically find the peak of this curve? Uh, well, it relates to the previous question because, as I just admitted, I lied. What this drawing here corresponds to is certain upper bound on the true curve. For this upper bound, finding this peak is straightforward. It's almost explicitly given function. We can find it. Finding the true peak of this curve for the original problem of interest, no, we cannot do that uh, because our methods are, are not tight enough to solve this, uh, find this function exactly. But they are tight enough to prove the monotonicity versus non-monotonicity. So what I missed the question. For some other models? Yeah, well, for the second, there, there are, maybe, maybe there's, uh, we don't know the state of the art algorithms, but uh, okay, where's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, there are algorithms that work uh, above a certain threshold. It's just the, the, we don't know algorithms that go all the way down to the information theoretic value. Maybe after offline we can finance that. Thank you. Thank you.